Um, you know, let's start with your book, Dr. Susan Love's Breast Book. Um, it was published in 1990. Um, you know, wh why then? What was essential about publishing a Bible on breast cancer at this time? Well, it wasn't exactly my intent to publish the Bible on breast cancer, but it was a time when there were a lot of changes happening in breast cancer and people were starting to do bre uh, breast conservation, lumpectomy and radiation. And before that it had been, everybody should have a mastectomy or a radical mastectomy. And so um, it was a time when we had science and we had, the NSABP doing research and randomized trials. And we could start to change how we treated breast cancer based on data, which was really something new and novel. And, um, and so that was the purpose of the breast book. And it went through many editions actually, um, and has been translated into many languages as well. Um, and now, of course, I think is much less necessary because we have lots of ways of getting information about breast cancer, but then there was nobody explaining anything. It was just, you know, we'll take care of you, dear. Don't worry about it. Um, and, you know, as, as you mentioned, uh, this was kind of a fascinating time to publish a book like this and, and really essential. Um, you know, what was, what was changing about the science of breast cancer at the time about what was known? Well, we were just making some, some big uh, understandings. We had been, prior to that, we'd been focused on surgery as the answer. And first it was radical mastectomies. You wanted to take the breast, the muscle, and all of the lymph nodes, which um, caused us a lot of problems. It, it did cure some people, but it still caused a lot of problems. Then we went to modified radical mastectomy where you left the muscle, but you took the breast and, the, and all the lymph nodes. And then finally, we had actually a randomized controlled trial comparing um, wide excision or lumpectomy uh, and radiation to uh, mastectomy. And the fact that women were willing to be randomized as to which they got by itself was, was pretty remarkable. And it turned out that lumpectomy or, or wide excision uh, followed by radiation was just as good as mastectomy, much to everybody's um, uh, amazement. And it really pushed us more into the, into the, gee, we can do breast conservation. We don't always have to do a mastectomy or a radical mastectomy. Um, and that was, a, that was a big step forward. And what did this step forward uh, mean for you, um, for your activism, your work, and your book? Well, I think what it really meant was I had, was writing the book, you needed to explain to people how, why we could do this. Because you couldn't just say to a woman who is not a physician, um, okay, well, we used to do meds techniques, but now we're just going to take the lump out and do radiation. It'll be just as good. I mean, people were, were really not up for that. You had to explain why and the fact that um, taking the, the lymph nodes out was helping you to know whether you needed to add something like chemotherapy and then taking the lump out and radiating it took care of the breast and and this was a this was complicated for a lot of women um, at that period of time where we were not used to giving the patient that much um, uh, you know chance of making the decision and it was often done by the doctor. So that, that itself, giving the patient a, a voice in the decision and then the change in the decision between um, breast conservation and mastectomy uh, were really big, big shifts. That's so interesting that, uh, you know, patients were able to have more of a say at this time. Um, I would imagine that this, this kind of science and this approach was very different than what you were taught in your medical training. Is that right? Well, it was taught as, it was, it was still considered, actually the best thing to do was to have a, a, a trial to randomize people, but it was much harder to randomize people to one operation or another than it was to one drug or another. Somehow, somehow the drugs didn't seem quite such a big deal, but doing a different operation based on just randomly pulling it out of a hat was a, was a big deal at that time. And so, um, and the other thing was that there were more women going into surgery. You know, at, at, there were very few women when I went into surgery, but, um, but and that's why 
I, I think they got drawn into breast surgery because they weren't given the chance to do big operations, gallbladders or, 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 or you know, big abdominal operations. So, um, but breast surgery was something that women were allowed to do. So that was the other factor in those days, more women as well as more consideration of um, breast conservation. Um, and and back, to, back in the days of your medical training, were you taught um, that lesser surgeons perform lesser mastectomies? Is that something you'd ever heard of? I had never heard of that. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I was taught that, that um, you know, it was, there was a sort of a sense of macho surgeons are going to do, you know, the bigger operation. And maybe some people, the people who were doing lesser operations were just, you know, not so macho. Uh, so there was a little bit of that, but I, I never heard about the lesser surgeons. <laughs> um, but going forward, let's get back to the book. Um, you're on the road, you're promoting it. Um, you end up in Salt Lake City. What, what happens there? Um, Boy, I don't even remember. You got to give me another clue. Sure, sure. Well, I know that um, when you had been to Salt Lake City, I know that about 600 people showed up for your talk to hear you talk oh, right. about your book. Right. right. Um, and they were excited and passionate about breast cancer activism. Um, you know, what, yeah. what did this feel like? Well, yes. Now I'm waiting till the phone finishes. Okay, there. Um, uh, well, in Salt Lake City, we had a big crowd of women, much, much more than we had previously. And um, at the end, I said, I don't know what we're going to have to do to, to, you know, change how we treat breast cancer and to cure breast cancer. Um, you know, maybe we should all march topless on the White House. And George Bush Sr. was in the White House. So he was not really keen on, you know, that I, wait a minute, George, <clears throat> George Bush Sr. was in the White House. And so the idea of all these topless women marching on the White House was enough to uh, launch the breast cancer advocacy movement. Yeah, I would imagine uh, that sounds quite a, like an amusing thing to happen. And, and were you surprised that people kind of took to this idea? Um, I was surprised. I mean, I was using it just as a line in a talk and they were ready to go. Um, and it really was the beginning of the end, I think, of, of, uh, of some of the older ways of treating breast cancer. Um, and did this actually happen, this, this walk to Washington topless? Uh, no. <laughs> topless. It didn't happen topless, but it, but it, it did happen that we had, a, had a, a march for Washington. Now, can I remember the details? No. So I'm not <laughs> But I, but we did. And, and that's a Fran Visco conversation. Amazing. Um, we'll, we'll actually get back to that later. Um, but I'm curious about, you know, what did this moment in Salt Lake City teach you about politicizing breast cancer? Well, I think what I really learned in, in, when we were at this meeting in Salt Lake City is if you have the, the right uh, answer at the right time, people are ready, you know, they were ready to do something. There had been enough information out there. There were books, there were enough talks that you just had to light the fire and they were ready to go. And I think that lesson taught me throughout my career that you just have to be aware of the moment and what's the right idea for the moment. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, and kind of touching on, on what we had just started discussing, um, this sort of grassroots activism, this excitement. Um, we actually recently ran an interview with Fran Visco in which she kind of describes this grassroots, um, exciting activism for breast cancer research funding at the time. Um, can you describe what, it, what was it like to be there? What was it like to witness and experience and take part in? Well, it was, it was quite, it was fun and exciting to be there. And it was interesting because uh, most of the people that were there were, um, uh, were not physicians or scientists or involved in actually treating or, or, or studying breast cancer. They were regular people who had had breast cancer or their mother had had it or their sister had had it. And they were, they were eager to hear the science and they were eager to look to how we could end it. And so it was not um, a bunch of scientists sitting in a room coming up with things. It was really a grassroots effort with some scientists that were 
that were liked grassroots sort of thrown in uh, that put things together. And because the, the women didn't know that much about breast cancer, um, and we wanted them to, to be able to uh, represent um, uh, what was going on, we started um, educating them in a program called Project LEAD. And we got different scientists to come. Um, and over a weekend, we would educate them on breast cancer. How does cancer work and how can we treat it? And uh, that was really that was really good because when we then went and and tried to lobby for more money, we were, all the women were very educated. They couldn't just say, "Oh, don't worry, dear. You know, we'll take care of it," because we already knew what was needed and we could demand it. That's very cool to hear about people kind of taking things into their own hands. Um, I, another thing I wanted to discuss. Um, oh, one second. Um, you know, it sounds like this type of activism was very different than what existed before it. Um, it Paul had mentioned, you know, there was Rose Kushner, there was Nancy Brinkner, there was Why Me. Mm -hmm. How was this movement different? Well, it sort of evolved around the same time as the AIDS movement, um, because really AIDS was the first time we had um, people with a disease, um, you know, lobbying and really involved in the research. And so it was around that that time, and that's what really pushed us, um, because the Nancy Brinker um, "Why Me" was wearing pink, and and you know there was some lobbying, but it wasn't the same as what what was started with the Breast Cancer Coalition, where really this was we want to be at the table, we want to be making the suggestions and making sure they happen, um, uh, not just marching around wearing pink. And I think that made a big difference. Right, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and which leads perfectly into my next question, um, you know, which is just about this meeting in Washington uh, with what would become the NBCC. Um, you know, who were the players involved? Um, what stances did everyone have? Well, um, I don't know that I can remember all of it, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think the people who showed up in Washington um, were really ready. And when we said, you know, we look, we should march uh, topless on the White House, they were, they were ready to come. They were, they actually had already come to the position of um, we need to do something and we're going to have to do it ourselves. So it was really a matter of rounding people up and coming up with time. And, and while I was good at, at rounding them up and, and getting them excited, Fran was really good at leading them <laughs> into the into the National Breast Cancer Coalition and also um, into all of the efforts thereafter. And it sounds like so all of this is almost leading up to this, you know, just this overwhelming support for breast cancer funding. Um, you know, just it became did it become sort of mainstream in a way outside of the people who who already were knew knew about it and were passionate about it. I think it's I think particularly when we moved, it became more pink <laughs> um, <laughs> that when, when, you know, Brett wearing a pink ribbon or wearing pink was a symbol of breast cancer, then it became more mainstream because then it wasn't, it didn't seem so crazy to wear pink. It didn't seem like you were rebellious. Um, it was a sign that, you know, we should pay attention to breast cancer. We should figure it out and, and know how to cure it. And, and of course the women, and the women with breast cancer were eager for that. So I, I don't think it was, it was quite so bad. Uh, once, it, once it got bigger, it was, this, it was when it was smaller that, it was, that there was the beginning of, of some problems. Got it, got it. Um, so it sounds like this sort of movement to wear pink, this came after all of this grassroots excitement, this talk of walking topless to uh, George yes. Bush Senior. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. That was their way of sort of let's make it calm it down, make it a little more, you know, less threatening. And so then people started wearing pink. Right, but I mean, I would imagine that before before the pink, when there was all this talk of excitement, you know, like what what moments from this sort of grassroots activism really kind of stood out to you, or what what still kind of sticks in your mind now about it all. Well, when we when we went to the White House, um, uh, and uh, I believe it was George Bush that we were with, um, that was really quite exciting because that was the first time it 
it really was clear that people were taking this seriously and that it wasn't just us complaining and, and, and uh, uh, you know, standing up and marching, but that people were actually paying attention to the problem and to the fact that we could do it. I mean, we had AIDS had just been a big problem and the people with AIDS really got very involved in raising money and in the research and how to, how to treat it and how to cure it. And so that was the example that the people with breast cancer um, took on. And, uh, and I think it, to, their, to their benefit. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, you know, and, and all of this ultimately and I talked about, a bit about this with Fran on her mission to get that 300 million. Um, but, you know, 1993, you all, you all did get that 300 million. Yeah. Um, and, and so what, what now? What happens after that? What are the next steps? Well, then we, we first of all, we had to uh, educate people in the science, because if we were going to figure this out, it couldn't just be the few physicians or the few researchers who are involved. And so Project LEAD, um, was developed and uh, with Patty Dickerson and myself and, and she was an epidemiologist and, and I'm a breast surgeon. And we did these uh, small program groups where we educated people in the science because until they really understood the science, we weren't gonna make a difference. And so that was, that was sort of step two and it recruited a whole lot of uh, people um, both who wanted to know more and also who are, who are eager um, to change breast cancer and, and, and to figure out how to either prevent it or, or cure it. That's great. Um, you know, and what, what did this, these kitchens, this, this, it just sounds like such a bright future, you know, what did this signify for the future of breast cancer advocacy for, for raising money and things like that? You mean now? Or in terms or of, then? um, then <laughs> <laughs> no. well, uh, well, the fact that, that what, the project lead and they having a group of educated women who were educated in breast cancer and in the science um, uh, was really important. And then we, we were demanding more research money. And so we demanded that we get it from the Department of Defense. We said enough money has gone to war and, 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 uh, and fighting it. Uh, we need money to actually fight breast cancer. And so the, depart the, the program um, was developed in the Department of Defense in order to give out research money um, for breast cancer research. And that was another big move forward that we actually were able to accomplish. Um, you know, and is there anything else? We, we touched on a lot of points during this timeline, but is there anything else you'd like to add um, or anything that's really important to the story? I, one of the things that I think was really is really important is that this this whole breast cancer movement, just along with the the AIDS movement, really changed how we look at diseases and how we look at um, trying to get more research and trying to get more people involved in it. And so now you see people who are involved with all kinds of diseases, from you know multiple sclerosis to something to, to um, uh, AIDS. You've got a whole you've got people who get a disease, always a percentage of them will end up trying to, to make it better, trying to figure it out. And this idea that regular old people or people with a disease could be responsible for figuring it out and maybe ending it was really started with AIDS and with breast cancer. 